Hello everybody. Welcome. Welcome to season 2 episode 3 of Intercultural Conversations. Um, I'm just going to wait for people to join in. Hi Venetia, I see that you're already here. Hello, hello Uva. Thank you for joining in. And today actually as you may know, we have, have we have started the episode at a much earlier time than usual, at least for me. It's because our guest from today is joining us all the way from Brazil. And this is what happens with intercultural uh, guests, at, guests from all over the world as well at Intercultural Conversations. We have to adjust and adapt. Um, and hopefully today, even though the time is different, Yes, you're always first here, Uwa. Thank you so much. And even though today our conversation starts at a different time, I hope that people are able to enjoy this um, after I share it. And I have a feeling today we're going to be nerding out a bit, especially with respect to technology, especially with respect to where technology is heading. And I, I, I hope everybody enjoys it the same way that my guest is going my guest and I are going to enjoy so just to give you a brief context of what we're going to be speaking about today right like even when man invented the wheel that was the technology of that time and that's how a lot of our culture moved forward a lot of humanity moved forward because of different kinds of innovations and inventions of technologies at different uh, times of the human race, existence of human race. Right? And like talking about the wheel right now seems like the real, real distant past. But like looking at where we've come now and just talking about the recent past with respect to the Industrial Revolution and what that did for our culture, what that did for people, what that did for economies is really noteworthy. And then we entered into the internet age where that also affected, of course, you know, a lot of people. And now we are, we are moving into a much more new space of technology and the internet. Right? So for people who are not familiar, we are now slowly moving into Web3. And for people who are not familiar with Web3, the most simplistic definition that I can give you and I'm sure I'm going to hear a lot of backlash after this as well. Web3 is where a lot of your data right now in the Web2 phase is held by organizations such as Google or Facebook. So they hold your data, they in a way own your data. We are now moving into a space where information is going to be much more decentralized. So these kind of organizations then don't have any ownership of your digital identity at least. Right. So we are moving into a much more decentralized space and I feel this is going to be this is going to affect our culture at a very large scale. So I definitely wanted to discuss that and I wanted to discuss that with a person who is very passionate about social technology, is passionate about uh, peer to peer engagements, that is a collaboration in a way that's not hierarchical, but collaboration in a way that is much more um, Collaborative in the sense of I'm 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 such I'm looking for the word is much more flatter is much more organic as opposed to it's an exchange as opposed to it being just passing down or trickling down of information, right? And uh, Vinicius does. Our my guest today is Vinicius, and he does so much. And this is the first time I have to read out somebody's introduction because what he does is also very new to me. So just to give you a very brief introduction, Vinicius is a co-creative facilitator in collective intelligence for social capital. He has participated in the strategic planning of the city of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, amongst many other projects. And I, I want to give Vinicius the chance to actually explain his projects and give us more insights on it. And uh, Vinny is interested in different kinds of early stage social technologies and decentralized open initiatives. 
Uh, that's actually how I met Vinicius through a project that we are both a part of called eDemocracy, which is about collective intelligence and changing the way we, the world sees democracy. And that's how I actually connected with Vinicius and I said that he had to come and speak about uh, peer to peer technologies and open source technologies. And in a way, he sees himself as a social explorer of different cultural worlds. So that's where uh, it completely clicked for Vinicius and I. And uh, today we are going to talk about how social technology actually affects cultures and Vinicius' thoughts on why the world actually is going in a good direction if or why they should rather uh, be collaborating in a much more peer-to-peer -peer way. Okay, so hopefully these are not too many <laughs> complicated words for you all and uh, hopefully Vinicius and I are able to kind of through our conversation define it much more simplistically so i'm just going to add vinicius mm. yeah there he is <laughs> hello everybody hi rishi Hello, hey. with the really cool Hello. glasses. I love it. <laughs> yeah, this glasses here is uh, is for you see we, we expose ourselves so much for the blue lightning coming from smartphones and from mm -hmm. electronics, mm -hmm. and they hurt our eyes. And if ah, you spend okay. a lot of time, it's my case. At I think it's your case too. I think it's most of the cases of humanity as a whole nowadays. Uh, you need to use these glasses, right? Like, um, oh. because it dashes out the blue light and the white light that really doesn't make a good. So it's not only to look cool, us. when you just. I thought it was just to look cool. I just, <laughs> yes. think I just help. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> but uh, the I'm, is, oh, I'm not able to hear you very clearly, Vinicius. Really? Oh, yes, I mean, wow. it's a bit low, the volume. I don't know if others are is able it, to hear him. Is it better now? Is it better now? Okay, I'm, I'm going to stay very close to the, to the mode in here. So, because, yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, here we are. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, <clears throat> Thank you, know, you so much. We could, I think that we could we, we could speak for ages, like uh, you know, on so many, so much, th <laughs> yeah. so much things to, to to speak upon. And uh, well, I know that you you already have quite of a, a direction to go with this conversation. So feel free to start it if you want. But yeah. uh, I just want first to, to acknowledge that I'm very happy to be here, folks. Uh, Thank you so much for being here. Prata, Prata is someone that, you, you know, uh, it, it, she has a sensibility, uh, she has, she has the, the vision, the understanding, the openness that is necessary to deal with cultural inter interchanges, you see. But it, as she knows, I go, <laughs> for me it's not only about interchange, yeah, it's more like, uh, uh, entanglement of cultures and mm -hmm. it's like more intermediate cultures because interchange puts you in the, in the position that oh my culture is this one your culture is that one so let's interchange our cultures yeah. and and for me uh for me to for us to intermingle intermingle our differences in culture is an evolutionary, uh, evolutionary, a co-evolutionary, uh, let's say, step that mm -hmm. we are just starting to do, right? We're just starting to do this. It, it's crazy to say that. I know that it's totally crazy to say this, but it's it's real, man. We're just starting to do this co-evolution intermingle of cultures yeah. in a very peer-to-peer -peer way, where you, you don't have the nation states properly doing, let's say, any sorts of representation or negotiation on your behalf. And, uh, and, that's, and that's something that's, 
it's 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 it's, it's the same time it's very powerful mm -hmm. but it's very micro it's very molecular yes it's, it's so, at a very individualistic level it's at a very i mean even if we're talking about cultures at large it still comes from here first of course and like talking about entanglement and talking about degrees of separation as well uh yes. and peer to peer i wanted to understand actually from you because a lot of my audience and i don't know how your audience is if they're familiar with the idea of peer to peer technologies or the idea or the concept of peer to peer collaboration either but before we dive into that of course we i would love to have your thoughts on what peer to peer technology is for you and or peer to peer form of collaboration even is for you if we are not focusing as much on technology and uh you know how how has your journey been and how has your journey of discovery been and you know how did you get invested in this i'd love to know that well <clears throat> it's interesting because most of our journeys if if we we stop to think a little bit a little bit more about it they we we do it unconsciously not aware that we're doing it like uh, you know uh there is this there is this dimension of of human intelligence that is related to intuition is related to subconscious and your unconscious of what you're doing you know when we talk about unconscious we're talking about the dream state or dream states we're talking about the dream realm you see lucid dreaming things like that this is this is this is part of reality this is a metaphysical part of reality right and the shamans knows this you know uh they know this very well so this is i know that i i'm i'm picking i'm i'm taking a a path here that i didn't talk with you yet but uh it, it came up it came from it came it came from me now as something good to share right right away right so uh that said uh it's interesting to 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 understand that the type the way that we do our journeys uh okay we set up some type of horizon right we put we put in a horizon some type of goals right but we really don't you see unless you're extremely obsessive with it like neuroscience by it uh you you just go with the flow right and when you go with the flow everything can happen and so you 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 really become aware after the experience itself so uh it, it's interesting to see to say that because to to say it the way that I'm putting because uh if you look around and see uh let's see uh all all the guidance that our societies give to us is to be fully aware of what you're doing right first and oh come on become fully aware of yourself fully aware of your surroundings and then set up your goals in the horizon and go to reach out to them yeah that's part of the equation but that's not the equation as a whole you see so there's a part of us that it's not rational that it's intuitional that it's relational but not in the in the language in the code language way is something that is profoundly interactional with the environment with everything and this thing doesn't you can't control it <laughs> so part of our journeys is is done un, we do we do our journeys unaware that we're doing we we really don't have a, 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 a the the minimal idea that we're already doing a lot of types of journeys so that said that's how i i i i i became aware uh of let's say the journeys that i was i was let's say uh uh, uh making uh making my, my my deep dives in but I, i was conscious that how deep was the dives and how broad they were like uh, i was just uh, driven by you know uh, so uh, because my main my main 
you see, my, my, main, uh, my main driver was uh, the curiosity. I just let my curiosity drive me. And, uh, and I was not planning to do anything, <laughs> only being driven by my curiosity. Mm -hmm. and, and, and my curiosity to, to reach out, uh, to get to know uh, what is happening out there or with those people that is actually me too, like, uh, you know, in the mirror dynamics. Uh, this this made, made me discover how peer-to-peer, -peer, <laughs> let's say, I was so I didn't made I didn't have any contact with the theoretical, let's say, stance around the peer to peer paradigm until let's say the two thousands, two thousand. So I'm talking about something that I was in the journey, Prata, like in the in the seventies, in the eighties, in the nineties, doing thirty years. I was literally uh, doing. Uh, all sorts of peer-to-peer -peer dynamics and discovering all sorts of social and cultural worlds. But I didn't mm -hmm. have the awareness that I was embedded in. Because it's not only me, it's everybody, even who is listening, who is listening, uh, me and you now. So uh, we are really embedded in this peer-to-peer -peer complex dynamics that it's, you can't rationalize it. It's very intuitive. It's very metaphysical. It's extremely complex. You see, yeah. And this is a huge part of our way to exist in, uh, within the complexity of this planet, oh. the nature of this planet. So for you, it was a realization that it, it it's much more interactional. Everything around you is much more interactional, and so yeah. your collaborations have to be that way as well. And the kind of work that your collaborations affect has to be very interactional and entangled as well. And that's how you have been, at least for the last 30 years. And Unmukt here, I don't know if he's still there on the live. He's left. He had a question. Hopefully he'll be back and we can answer that question. And, you know, as you were speaking about interactionality and talking about how it is supposed to be that way, in a way, is my understanding. And in our previous conversations, you would also mentioned that a lot of your work, even when you're dealing with technology, is actually inspired by nature and the na yes. nature around you. So it would, it would be lovely for us to understand how you are collaborating these two ideas, how you're merging these two ideas. Because when we speak about technology, we don't think about, at least I don't, think about <laughs> nature, right? And be inspired by nature to then affect technology. So I, I would love to, you know, for our audience to know your thoughts on it and your inspirations for it as well. Well, uh, it, I think it's the same thing, um, you know. Uh, you see, a, as child, uh, as when we were our infancy as child, we are extremely curious about everything. We touch everything. We play with everything. Everything is playful. Everything uh, says something to us, even if we, we don't um, we don't have the language to understand or to conceptualize it. You know, and. Uh, this spirit is, is natural for us, right? And if you look around and, and, and see, nature has all sorts of interdependencies. Everything is related to everything, all times, right? All times. So you have a profound and complex peer-to-peer -peer framework in nature. Like, uh, it's, it's, it's constant. <laughs> the only thing that is not constant in nature is, is, the, is, the, is the patterns of organization and the modes of regulation. Because, you see, when we talk about patterns of organization, we're talking about basically centralized, decentralized, and distributed, right? Distributed. These three patterns. But in nature, they don't occur separately. Like, oh, now it's only centralized. Now it's only... No, no. They occur at the same time, right? So a hurricane is a has a centralized pattern, right? But it's ephemeral, it's temporal. 
it's moment, momentum. It's, it's, it, it occurs in, 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 in some momentum, in some space-time momentum, and then dissipates, right? So this is a, a natural phenomenon that is centralized. So you can have a lot of little tornadoes happening in, in, in a large coast. This is a decentralized phenomenon. So, and you can have, you can have all sorts of winds uh, uh, coming up with all sorts of, of, of little, little, uh, little wiggles. This is a very distributed phenomenon. So everything in nature, every pattern of, pattern of organization, and please folks, don't 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 uh, uh, understand that patterns patterns of organization is not the same as the organizational paradigm that our species created, right? They're they're different things. They're not the same things, right? So the, in nature, patterns of organization occurs as an emergent phenomenon. So they configure as an emergent. The, uh, they are the outcome of complex interaction between all the elements, all the inter interdependency that, that happens, right? And they have modes of regulation, can be more horizontal, can be more vertical, and can be transitional. So when you have all these axes dealing at the same time, you have complexity as a whole, you see? Mm -hmm. and, and for me, for me in this sense, uh, the inspiration that nature gives me is to look at this and see, wow, couldn't we, as part of nature, as one of the million species of nature, couldn't we just do the same? Couldn't we just go with the flow? Couldn't we just emerge in different patterns of organization, different modes of regulation? And this is, this is a question that came for me, uh, you know, in the, two, in the early, early, early 80s. Uh, not, not, not so sophisticated as I put it now, but I was curious to know if we could go with the flow with nature and not treat nature in a neo-Darwinistic way, like a, a place of constant competition, of constant predation, where you have to survive. Wait a minute, <laughs> what you're talking about? <laughs> Hold your horses. <laughs> Are you saying to me that nature competes? Are you saying to me that nature predates? Nature is the very essence of life. Life that, turned, that made this planet habitable for life was not the planet itself that made uh, it, it habitable for life, you see, was the, 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 the bacteria realm that was capable of to generate all sorts of more sophisticated elements like oxygen and hydrogen that made it possible, you see, to exist life in this planet. And it's, and it's extremely resilient. So it's not the way, the, the all the way around, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, yeah, yeah, I think the, the way people then look at it now, though, is that there's such limited resources, especially, you know, I come from a very populated country and then, you know, we have such limited resources, it's impossible then to not be competitive. I think then that also kind of stems from scarcity thinking probably, but then we are, the resources are scarce. We can't do anything about it in a way, at least now, or we can, or we ought to rather. And I think that's where the competitiveness comes from, as opposed to it being collaborative or it, it, it's a bit difficult then for people to go with the flow when you're just working towards your means. You know, we are diverging, yeah. of, but I think it's an interesting conversation. Yeah, but but but, but let's 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 uh, let's put a caveat there. Uh, the first thing I thought is that um, uh, you see, once we created the organizational paradigm, we created we created the the need to control and systematize and plan for everything. And we created the concept to systematize things. So to, for massive scales, right? So this is not natural. Mm, okay. So this is not a natural move. When we became sedentary, when we were nomads, 99% of our existence as a species, you know, 
with other hominids like Neanderthals, you know, uh, or, or Homo florensis in Australia, when we were nomads, uh, uh, we had this capability to adapt, uh, uh, to adapt in each season. Uh, we had the capability to intermingle with what nature was, let's say, offering, right? Open, close, 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 what nature has time to time. And we were extremely adaptive and collaborative and peer-to-peer -peer in our access. And okay, we weren't 8 billion people, or I, I know that, but we had a way to not to extract from nature, you see? We, had, we didn't have extractive relationship with nature. We didn't systematize distraction like we systematized on our industrial and post-industrial civilization that we became mm. a sedentary species. We had a very uh, 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 regenerative dynamics with nature. Everything that we, 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 we collected, right? Uh, everything that we collected, even everything that we killed, uh, even everything that we killed to eat or collected to eat, whatever, uh, uh, we, we put it as a, a sacred dynamics. Like, uh, for, for, we had, it had meaning for us, you know? So the type of relationship that we had with nature, it's completely different to the way that we, we deal with nature. Since we became a sedentary species, we create the concept of societies and civilizations. So there's a huge difference. There's a huge difference. But I understand what you're saying. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. It makes sense. Give me some perspective as well. And, you know, now I believe we, we definitely need to move into a much more collective way of thinking, for sure, and collective way of collaborating. Uh, and I think that, that's the way forward if we want to even survive. <laughs> Uh, not to sound not to sound like it's going to be doomsday tomorrow but still and I, that that kind of leads to my next question for you right right now open source platforms are so uh, uh like m there are many organizations that are coming up with open source platforms and open source technologies it's basically creating technology that everybody has access to and then keep building on that right so i just wanted to understand from you you know, now that we're moving into that phase where everybody is getting more collective, collaborated, and open sourced, what does open? What are? What is this open source movement? And how do you think it's going to affect cultures? And how do you think it's going to affect people at large? Well, uh, yeah, that's a very tricky question. You know, when you asked me earlier about this question, I said, "Well, let's keep it." <laughs> I, I'm going to say why it's tricky. Uh, you, you know, when we, if we, folks, if you go to Wikipedia and put and, and Google it, like uh, what is open source, you're going to see that this is a word that was created in the 90s uh, by some software guys uh, that uh, create Linux, for instance, right? And they thought open source uh, was, uh, you see, this open code, open source code thing yeah. that everybody can, can access. That, that's what it means to me also. <laughs> yeah. At least that's fun. Yeah. Yes, but, but there's a lot of buts there. Uh, in the 70s to the 80s, a guy called Richard Stallman, he, he started a movement called Free Software, right? And it was more relational. Is more, more it had a more. It was more related to the computer, so for the rights for any human being uh, to say have a computer and the, and the computer interface be friendly and be free. Free, not in a sense of price, but free in a sense of freedom, where you can actually, let's say, co-create your own hardware and co-create and, and 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 do your own software. So he goes way beyond just uh, not being priceless. You can see it's, it's about freedom, freedom of expression, 
you know? And uh, this movement that uh, came out in the 90s, the open source movement, was not so, it's not about the philosophy, it's not about the freedom of expression, it's about the openness of the code. Mm -hmm. But you have a lot of buts there. Like, uh, oh, you, 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 can, you can access the source code, but depends for what you're using, we're going to charge you or not. Or no, you, you, you can't you, you can't you can't redistribute it without this proper license here. So you, you need to have this license. So uh, it's interesting because my take on open source uh, it, it's very different from the the way that let's say uh, Wikipedia. <laughs> I'm, I'm using Wikipedia because it's a reference for everybody still, right? So it's web too, but it's still a, a reference uh, for everybody. So open source is, is a more corporate, once more, is a more corporate take on the open code of software than free software is. So, uh, so the guys over free software with time, they created a, a new expression called open, uh, uh, Free, libre, in, in Spanish, free, libre, open source software, mm. FLOSS, F-L-O-S-S, FLOSS. That means that you're not only opening the code at all for, for everybody and all means that you can imagine, but you have the freedom of expression to use this code individually and collectively, the way that you... you, 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 you suits it suits for you it suits for the collective or suits for the individual you see so <laughs> that's why i'm saying it's tricky because when you when you look it out uh, look it out there the open source expression it was created in the 90s like for guys from linux starvids from the linux foundation and, and 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 it was it's different from the way that richard stallman in the 70s and the 80s conceived the free software movement, you see? Uh, so this is, this is the first thing, just to, mm -hmm. to, to clear out. Thanks. The second thing is, is that um, it's interesting because coming out from the open source, let's say, concept that came out of the software movement, right? You have open hardware, you have open design, you have all sorts of opennesses. You see, coming out, and that doesn't mean that they they inherit the same, let's say, political stance or the same way uh, to perceive openness. You see, so you have a variety of open source movements that they we can still say that they are in their infancies, you know, but as nature, you have different kinds of open source movements. You see, so uh, and some of them are 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 extremely political, and and they have relationship even with this uh, with this uh, this culture that is out there, especially in Twitter, the cancel culture. They have you have the ethical source movement that uh, if you, if you, if you if you're a person with my color of skin. You don't have the why. You have the, don't have the right to even to open your mouth, and they call it ethical open source movement. You see, so you have a, a, a myriad of, of of things that is happening with this concept open source. So this is the second thing. So the third thing is that, uh, in, in my understanding, this is okay. This is my perspective. Okay, okay, folks. Uh, in my understanding. Uh, nature is open source by nature. <laughs> Everything <laughs> in nature is extremely open source. Everything is reachable for every everything at the same time. So, in my understanding, the type of let's say freedom or the type of conceptualization of freedom that uh, the this more complex, you know, this more complex peer to peer dynamics that I'm talking about. Uh, uh, generates for all of us as a species is is not political is not a political stance is a cultural 
I, I think this is you're gonna you're gonna like to hear uh, from that. So we're talking about a peer to peer dynamics that is not making a political stance or camp first, like you have in the open source movements all over. Uh, we're talking about something so much interactive. It's not participation, folks. It's extremely interactive that is generating a new culture of relationships between different cultures, intermingling different cultures. So mm -hmm. this, is, that's, this is something that is not captured by the nation state. It's not captured by markets, you see? And the relationship that this has with Web3 is incredible, but it's not out there yet. Let me say this. It's not out there yet. Why? Because, of course, everything that comes out of technology, at first, you know, we, we as a species, as societies, as civilizations, we interlaced, uh, we interlaced uh, uh, technology with economics, right? So the type of Web3 that is out there is more driven for, from economics, from an economic point of view, like a monetary or people monetary point of view, than a cultural one. So that's the difference. And, and I think that we now have the, the, the interconnectedness between us, you know? It, it's, it's paradoxical, okay? Because this interconnectedness came, came out of this very sophisticated, algorithm-oriented web two uh, corporate platforms like Facebook, like Instagram that we're using, like Twitter, but it created a culture of interconnectedness. And this interconnectedness that is possibility making this conversation that me and you are having right now uh, be a conversation, be something interactive and not only an exchange of culture, you see? So that's my stance in this type of open source. This is, is a complex driven open source. It's not something politicized, it's not something coming from the organizational paradigm, you know, mm -hmm. that you only use collective intelligence for, to develop your product, your service, like crowdsourcing, for instance, mm -hmm. or you only use the, your capability to fund with crowdfunding. So this is very, you see, this is very shy. <laughs> if, if, if we look, what is actually now occurring with us? We are actually, uh, uh, oh, what's more? We're not aware that we're doing this. You remember when we started our conversation earlier? We're in this journey and we are not aware that we are already, let's say, co-evolving ourselves in a very interactive manner because interaction mm -hmm. is very powerful. Interaction, people, is a social peer-to-peer -peer technology. It's different from participation, you see? Participation is, is pre-designed. So there's a time for you to speak, there's a time for you to vote, there's a time for you to you know, to do such things. So participation, it's very limited. And uh, interaction is very emergent, you see, mm -hmm. like nature. So you merge different patterns of organization, you deal with different modes of regulation. So that's what's coming for us, but we, as a species, we are not aware of it. That's yeah. basically my stance. <laughs> so we are, we, are, we are heading towards a future which we are not fully able to comprehend at the moment. And I hope people see then the value. At, if, if they're not able to understand that that's going to be the future, I at least hope that they see the value in these kind of peer-to-peer -peer interactions for sure. And uh, unfortunately, we are a bit short of time. It's supposed to be only 30 minutes. So I'm going to skip one question, but I really wanted to know you know, you're, you're, you're in Brazil at the moment, if I'm not wrong. And I wanted to know your perspective or, you know, just for the audience to know as well, how has Brazil kind of adapted to this new paradigm that we're talking about? Has there been, been an acceptance? Has there been at least a slight awareness of it, of us? And I'm talking about this in a context of, of course, like <laughs> Web3 and peer-to-peer -peer networks. What has been the acceptance of it? And is there anything that the world can learn from Brazil when it comes to this? Well, you see, when, when you make a question like this one, Prata, uh, you're making a, a question within the actual 
uh, ethos and, 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 and paradigm of the type of society that we became, right? So I have to answer in this, in this framing, right? So I'm going to answer in this framing and then I'm going to give you, let's say, a more uh, personal uh, perspective. I'd love that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So Brazil is, uh, is a very interesting place to be, not only because you have all sorts of uh, different cultures coming from all places in the planet here, you know, in different stages, but uh, mostly uh, by the, the colonizing movements that done by Europe initially, you know, uh, and then the United States, you know, I'm, I'm not going to, to go in, in, in this sense, but uh, what I'm saying that you have all sorts of populations, ethical populations here that are mixed up with uh, the the indigenous people that was already living here, as you know, uh, for thousands of years, and uh, in that sense, it's people that came here. They came uh, uh, out of places that was in war or that was expelled by religions, you know, and uh, or or about trafficking people, like uh, trafficking, you know, uh, uh, black people, trafficking uh, 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 yellow people, all sorts of colors of people <laughs> puts out there. And uh, so you don't have, Brazil, it's interesting. Brazil is a place that you don't have the concept of nation and state uh, uh, binded together, you see? So you, 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 because you don't have the concept of nation, uh, the concept of, it's a very, it's a, you see, it's only 520 years or 30 years, I, I think, since uh, uh, the Europeans discover, let's say, uh, this huge continental land here, and that they call it Brazil. <laughs> like, uh, so you don't have this concept of a nation, per se, you see. And, and the states has this very extractive relationship with all sorts of cultures here. So you, you have a, a type of, of, of a, a play space here. Uh, you have a, a social play space that allows everything to happen at the same time. And uh, that's very interesting, right? Because uh, so everything can happen here. Basically, I'm just trying to say, every type of social economic experience, experiment, it, it, you, have, you have the space to do it because you don't have any sort of heavy, heavily, let's say, regulations coming from the state to the society, you know? Uh, yeah, that said, uh, uh, when it comes to peer-to-peer -peer paradigm, when it comes to Web3, so you have all different things happening here at the same time. So you have some folks coming mostly from the metropolitan, great metropolitan areas like Sao Paulo, Rio, Curitiba. You have folks experimenting with crypto markets, with, uh, with, with, with Bitcoin, with Ethereum. So yeah, you have those, you have that type of bubble, let's say, you know? So, and now I, I, I you have some folks starting to uh, a movement, a, a real movement throughout Brazil uh, in little cities in the countryside, talking about regenerative finance, that it's very web three ish right? So, and this is, uh, this is not coming from the metropolitan area, it's coming from the countryside of Brazil. So uh, that's, that's another play space that is it's, it's just starting and I, I'm extremely involved with this, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, what I'm saying is that in Brazil, you, you, you can't make a total, you, you don't have a, a, a totality of things happening at the same time in a macro, let's say, dimension. Everything is extremely uh, fractured, decentralized, let's say, let's put it this way. So you have a lot of things, peer-to-peer -peer and Web3, uh, uh, occurring at the same time in very, in very different social worlds and definitely different cultures, and that's the beauty of Brazil in this sense, not as a nation state, but 
you know, because as I said, it's not really binded, you know. You see, the only way that people uh, relate, still is now in a massive, in a massive way, relates to Brazil as a nation state is by soccer, like the now the World Cup that is happening. Is it still something that binds everybody? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, see, in a massive scale, but that's it, basically. So, but you have, of course, you have those very reactionary people, uh, you know, conservatives or reactionary very people that uh, that understands that has their allegiance, their obedience to the flag, to the nation, you know, the concept of the state, and things like that. But that's not a huge person. Uh, let's say percent percentage of the of the population. You see, we're almost 220 million people. I know that it's dwarfs. Uh, uh, when, when we look at the you mean? <laughs> yes, uh, to Egypt, but yes, it's not a huge part. Or, or China, for instance. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I, so this is my this is my answer for you, just to say uh, that. All things about around peer to peer, all things around Web3 is occurring here in Brazil. So you don't have something uh, extremely driven by economics only, and you don't have something that is extremely institutional, like uh, like you have in Europe, for instance, or extremely economical, like you have in the United States. So mm -hmm. you know there, there's a difference. And uh, in my now my perspective, my perspective is that. Uh, uh, the, the, the opportunity to have this type of conversation, Pratad, that we're having here, this type of interaction, the quality of interaction, you see, you have sufficient openness by most of the people still nowadays in Brazil, even if they are in different technological stages, like they, you know, there's some places in Brazil that where you don't have internet, literally, you don't have web two, you don't have nothing, but people are still empathically driven and very open to sit and to hear and to interact with you. So this kind of openness is, is a very cultural trace of Brazil. And this, this is a fertile ground to, you see, have this molecular, peer-to-peer, -peer, complex-driven peer uh, conversations and, 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 ex and experimentations mm. uh, where, where a, proto a cultural protocol that we have be calling like re re regenerative resources is is able to flourish. Like uh, uh, you see, if I, I if we we, we we try to start something like uh, uh, regenerative resources that is a Web three cultural protocol in the United States, I don't know if we would be successful because it's very economic driven. If we do something like this in Europe. Uh, maybe in Spain, I don't know, because Spain is very commons-driven, is very co-op-driven, but I, I don't know if in the... I mean, yeah, I think it depends, and I, I think that that's where my bias as an interculturalist also comes in. We have these definitions for different kind of cultures of how they behave and how that culture affects their behaviors and how they look at collaborations. Is it more from an individualistic level or a collective uh, paradigm or perspective? perspective and South American countries, unfortunately, I'm just generalizing, are much more collective than the North American countries. So similarly, it goes for uh, Asian countries compared to some of the European countries where it's more individualistic compared to more collective. So I'm assuming, you know, peer-to-peer -peer collaborations and Web3 technologies, it means the entanglement of people working together, then cultures like like ours should be much more easily adaptable to these kind of changes compared to others. And I hope that everybody gets on the same paradigm and the same space <laughs> eventually. But yeah, I, I'm, people who are used to it may find it easier. They just need the accessibility to the technology for sure. And um, so yes, Venetia, this is we're coming towards the end of our conversation. Uh, and I usually end most of my conversations with this question. It is because I relate to this word change a lot because I feel a lot of change has happened within me in the past few years. And I see like a paradigm shift happening in the world around me also. 
So I just wanted to know from you what does change mean to you, of course, and if there's one thing that you would like to change, either within yourself or around yourself, what would it be? Because I think your your a lot of your work actually involves changing the way and breaking a lot of patterns of thinking and the way that we've done things for generations and generations. So I'm really looking forward to your answer, actually. Yeah. For me, change is already happening. It happens at the same time. Uh, that's, the, that's, that's the thing. Uh, you see, uh, we tend, as imaginative species, uh, where, you know, we, we like to play, we like to, we're a playful species, uh, we, we like to invent all sorts of toolings, tools uh, to play with. But, uh, but uh, before that we are very imaginative. So we like to imagine things and, and, and make it a reality, right? So that sense, we are already changing where, when we are imagining things. Uh, so because in this dimension of our, our mental capacities or, you know, uh, uh, and, and we actually don't, we, we don't, we, we really don't know what happens with our brains still. We think we do with neurosciences, uh, and I'm very keen to to you know to 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 read the works of neurosciences, but I don't discard uh, I don't discard uh, 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 the works the psychological and the dream state thing that the surrealists uh, talked about in, in last century. The surrealists uh, like André de Beton uh, from France. Uh, with, the, with the Surrealist Manifesto and, uh, and when he, he conceptualized that this is, this is Surrealism as this other reality that is part of this more 3D, more materialistic, more conscious driven reality. So even the concept of new sphere, new sphere, the conscious, the, 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 envir the dimension environment of the conscious came out of the surrealist, surrealist movements in, in, in the last century. So what I'm saying is that we are always changing all times, but we, don't, we are not conscious that we're changing all times. Because, and that relates to regeneration that we, we, we have, we, we speak very little about it. Regeneration is not only about being sustainable, Regeneration is not only uh, about uh, you feed yourself with good food. Uh, regeneration is is something that it it, it, it envelops you. It's a, it, it's part of life itself. Life ge regenerates life all times. You see, so uh, we are not aware of the totality of regenerative dynamics that our body is doing right now. My body and your body, right? We're not aware of that. And we don't have conscience of that, like, uh, you know? So for me, change is something that is a, is a flow, is a flux. So we are always changing, but uh, we, we tend to imaginative conceptualize change like uh, a persona. Oh, I'm this person now. I want to become that person there, you see? And, and this, oh, that, it's okay with that, but this is only a fraction of what is to, you see, what is change in the existence. So <laughs> change is the, is the currency of life. We're always changing, <laughs> if you're, even if you're not aware that you're changing. So we're always changing all times. So that's my, my two cents. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, and I think one one of the best answers I've heard so far, for sure. So, Vinicius, thank you, thank you so much for sharing your insights, for sharing I'm, what I'm assuming is a lot of new information for my audience at large, and hopefully, when they see it even later, when they're listening back to it, there's something that they can think about, and that there is a little bit of a paradigm shift of how they look at technology and the world and how nature affects us. So thank you so much for your time, Vinicius. I'm very grateful. And I know it's really early in the morning for you. Thank no, you for taking up okay. your early morning time. <laughs>
<laughs> and I hope it's to, sunny. I hope to, it's yeah. Sunny. Sunny, sunny, day here. sunny day, yeah. Sunny day today. Yeah. And, and I hope to see you soon. Of course, uh, yeah. we, we, we already, uh, we partake uh, a project that is e-democracy yeah. now. It's just in its beginning. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of things to, 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 to share there. A lot of things. Yes, with e-democracy, there's a lot of things to unravel. And think yes. with e-democracy, there needs to be a separate conversation because then that is deep diving into what democracy means. And, you know, that, that, that's another three-hour conversation easily. <laughs> No, no, this is something. This is something interesting, Prata. Before you you, you wrap it up, uh, you see, folks, uh, we're so, so we're, we're so uh, amazed, open quotes, close quotes, about this scarcity logic that we think that generates a more sustainable, a more secure uh, way to live in this planet. That uh, we we are the only species that created time. We, we created the concept of time. We, as a species, create the concept of time. And we put time as a measurable thing. So uh, when we constrain ourselves in 30 minutes uh, uh, talk here <laughs> on, on Instagram, um, I, I, I actually, I, we have to synthesize. Like uh, Prata has to synthesize in some questions, and I have to synthesize. That's true. You see, this is... This is very interesting. You see, uh, yeah, the effort to synthesize answers for your, the, whatever questions uh, one's, one has is, is a very interesting exercise, but it shouldn't be the only one that we practice in daily basis. So when we measure ourselves by this measurable time that we created, our species created, we're being driven by scarcity. We're not really being driven by abundance. You see, and uh, and and that's that that's a very interesting thing. Uh, so, just just to finish out our conversation yes. here, so I, I felt extremely constrained by scarcity <laughs> to give you extremely <laughs> synthesized answers uh, to something that we could skip, we could well, we, we could have a whole may, life. Maybe we need another life where we just don't stop. We have no scarcity. There's a separate show where we keep talking and then we no, don't no, no, stop. There's no scarcity of time or information. <laughs> but, but, but remember, remember, scarcity is part of the thing. It's part of the equation of abundance, you see? But not this artificial scarcity that we create. It's mm. different. But this is, this is a talk for another time. So, yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately. Th th yeah. Th thanks. Th th thanks a lot for your invitation, Pata, once more. Uh, and, and folks, I'm, I'm really not in my best. Like, um, <laughs> uh, there are days that you are more aware of what you're saying. And, and, and I'm clearly not so aware of what I'm saying right now. Uh, you, know, you know the feeling uh, that you're, you're speaking something that you could speak, let's say, better or, you know, uh, but uh, you're not so, you know, your full potential to say things. So <laughs> that's, that's my day today. Like, uh, I say, whoa, uh, I wish I was in a more, with more, you know, more, more capability to express myself, but it's not that bad day for me. I'm not yeah, we still have an opportunity, probably, you know, once I share this video, you can add more text to the, com to the comment. Of course. And, you know, people can then refer to it if, if you think you've missed out on something, which I, but a I think it was a great conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you so much, Juni. Bye. Thank you, everybody, for bye joining me. Bye. bye, folks. Thanks bye. a lot. Forgive me bye. anything. Let's bye. go. Bye-bye. <laughs> bye. -bye. bye.